Recording in progress. Mark, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, by the way, I, I took the mask off. I hope it's okay so you can hear me a little better. I sometimes find that I, I mumble into the mask when I have it on. So um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for inviting me. Um, we love doing these sessions. We do them all over the state. In a, in a normal year, if we ever get there, we do about 100. But even last year, we did, you know, in the range of 70. The, I'm so delighted to be doing it in person. I've gotten really tired of doing them on the screen. I don't know about you guys. Um, when you're doing them on the screen, people turn their cameras off, and I'm talking to myself for an hour. That doesn't, you know, that's not a whole lot of fun. So uh, we do the sessions not to beat you up, not to make you miserable, but as Mark said, to, to help, to answer questions, to try to make it a little bit easier for you to deal with any issues that uh, involve freedom of information so that you're better able to pay attention to the to the tasks that you've been assigned to do, that you've been elected to do, to help Watertown out. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, it's a, it's a little bit like, like being home for me, coming over here. Uh, I, I lived uh, in Naugatuck, born and raised, grew, grew up there. Um, as I was driving up here, the, I used to be a sports writer. I covered uh, many games at the land. Is that still the land field? Is that what we still call it? Memory's still there. So. Uh, I remember going over to games there, and uh, I went to high school at Taft up the road. So I kind of knew where I was going. I still needed to put the address in GPS because the last time I came here, the town hall was somewhere else. But anyway, so um, I'm not an attorney. I don't know if there are any in the room. I say that because I'm not able to give you any binding legal opinions. These are not orders from the commission. These are not commands. It's just advice based on uh, going on 21 years at the FOI commission. Uh, things that I've seen, things that I've observed. I've, I obviously am in constant contact with our attorneys and, and our commission members, so I'm, I'm telling you the best advice based on what we think you ought to do under certain circumstances. You may listen to this and you may say, okay, that's great, now we know what he says, and you may run into a situation and you say, gee, that's not quite what we want to do, and if you think you've got a better answer, by all means, you know, go ahead and and do what you need to do, but at least you've got a basis upon which to make a decision. That's, that's the, the ultimate goal here is to try to help you. Um, again, ask questions as we go along. Don't be afraid to just shoot your hand up and say, wait a minute, that's not how we do it here, or that's not how I understood it, and we'll be happy to try to straighten it out. And again, as Mark said, if I don't know the answer, I'm not afraid to say I don't know the answer. I'll be happy to, uh, to get it for you. Give me an, uh, an email address or a phone number, and I'll get it for you. So, freedom of information in the state of Connecticut. It's the law, first of all. It's not just this really neat idea. It's 46 years old. It was Ella Grasso's brainchild when she ran for governor for the first time. And if you do the math, 46 years ago puts us right smack in the middle of Watergate. And you had a country that was in turmoil, a country that was beset by problems, many of which were caused by secrecy, things being done behind closed doors, clandestine meetings, things that sort of almost, well, almost brought the country to its knees. And Ella Grasso was in Congress when Watergate exploded all around us. She was contemplating this run for governor, and she said, you know, if I run for governor one of the first, and win, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to create some sort of an open government law. I want to make sure that what is happening here around me in Washington does not happen in Connecticut. So as you know, she ran, she won. 1974, first woman ever to be elected in her own right in the United States as a governor. And one of the first things she did was put forward this concept of, of an open government law. She felt it was really important, and she thought so much of it that she said, this law is, is so important, we're putting it forward, and I'm going to guarantee, I'm going to see to it that this law is approved unanimously by our legislature. Have you ever watched the legislature? Can you imagine? Can you imagine guaranteeing unanimous vote on this law or on anything? Well, I'm here to tell you 
She got that unanimous vote. I've seen a video. There wasn't a single no vote in the House, not a single no vote in the Senate. This law passed unanimously. Now, I tell you that because it's interesting. It shows you how important it was then and how important it is now. But it also, folks, gives us some insight as to why we're having discussions like this. Because think about the process. Any of you who are politically savvy, you know what I'm talking about. You get to the point where you want everybody to vote yes. I mean everybody. There had to be a lot of compromise and a lot of back and forth and a lot of arm twisting and a lot of, well, I like this, but do you like that? So you've got a law that's based on a really simple, easy concept. Open, transparent, governmental entities. Public agencies do their work in public. But when you read it, has anybody tried to read it? Has you tried to even read a paragraph or two? Your eyes roll immediately to the back of your head, especially those of us who are not trained legally. It's like, wait a minute. I thought it was the, but this, because what, the, what they did was they created a law that's, that's, you know, has got a good base, but it leaves a lot open to interpretation. And guess who gets to do that? Those of us who are on the front lines. I should have mentioned that I'm, you know, I'm one of you too. I was, I've been on a board in my town for years. I was on one board for 10. I was a member of the Board of Selectmen for two. Now I'm on another board. And it's, you're constantly trying to remind yourself that there's this law that governs how we do business. A lot of times, especially if you're new, you say, gee, we don't do it that way at the bank. We don't do it that way at the insurance company. That's not how we do business. But this law requires a certain amount of openness that we all have to pay attention to. And then we also have to be able to know the ins and outs enough to be able to interpret it so that you don't find yourselves as the topic, uh, the subject, I should say, of a freedom of information complaint. Another thing that this law did, in addition to you know, writing the law was it created the Freedom of Information Commission, which is where I work. And when people believe they've been denied the rights that this law guarantees everybody, they file a complaint against the public agency with the Freedom of Information Commission. And the FOI Commission's role is to adjudicate those complaints and decide, you know, whether you've upheld the law or whether you violated the law. And you really don't want to be involved in one of those complaints if you can at all avoid it. So the idea is to give you the tools to work with so that you can figure things out and work things out. And also, frankly, to have a new resource, uh, you now have a face to put with a voice on the other end of the phone. I answer questions all day at the FOI Commission uh, via, via phone, via email. And now you know, OK, this is the guy we're going to call. And we'll, again, get you an answer. I'd rather you call before something becomes a problem so that we can get you in a position to not have to be involved in something that's uh, contentious or even leads to a complaint. So the, the law is called freedom of information, but it's really about access. It should really be called freedom of access. It's about access to two things, the meetings of public agencies and the records of public agencies. Now, since many of you are, are, are board members, I'm going to focus a lot of my time tonight on the meetings provisions and just give you a, a, a nutshell of the records. Uh, but if there's a question about anything, I want you to, I want you to ask it. And, and freedom of access is more appropriate, but people see freedom of information, and they see that as an invitation to ask questions. Have any of you had that? People come in, you know, under freedom of information, I have a right to know. Tell me how you got to this budget figure. Why did this happen? I saw a cruiser in my neighborhood last night. What happened? Freedom of information, I have a right to know. Well, people do have a right to know, but they have to do a little bit of the work. They have to go to the meetings where the issues are being discussed. That's what this law lets them do, observe their boards in action, or get the records where the information is contained. One of the first lessons that we always try to teach folks is that freedom of information does not mean you have to answer questions. People peppering you with questions, it doesn't mean you have to do that. Now, we're all public servants, right? We're going to do that. But there may come a point in the conversation where you say, you know what, I'm, I'm just not comfortable answering that, or I'm not sure I'm clear on the answer. And I'm not going to. Well, FOI violation. No, it's, it's, that's not something that the law requires you to do. And I should share with you, if that's happened to you or, or at some point down the road, I want you to think about you've talked to the Freedom of Information guy. Think about working at the Freedom of Information Commission and being the person who answers the questions. People think that we're information center for the entire state of Connecticut. People call up and ask for directions to the Capitol. People call up and ask for you know tax records and stuff like that. Some people say, you know, Tom, forget the FOI stuff. Tell them stories. Um, do a couple hours of stand-up. Well, I'm not, I'm not that good, but let me, let, me, let me share a couple with you. First of all, people think we sit in this giant vault. 
that we have every record held by every agency in the state of Connecticut. They call us up, they ask us to send it to them, push a button, and out it comes. I have to explain, no, that's, that's not what we are. We don't do that. That's, we're, you know, we're here to, and, and, and so occasionally we get some doozies. Here's, here's one I'll just share with you. This actually started a couple of years ago, and it sort of continued. But this, this is an email that came in, and it goes like this. Dear sir, please provide an electronic copy via email, preferably a spreadsheet, showing all the Medicaid-paid electroconvulsive tra treatments, a.k.a. ECT, a.k.a. shock treatment. My request includes every field you have available, but certainly not patient identifiers. This request includes, but is not limited to, the name of the psychiatrist, license number, date of treatment, age of patient, city, county, name of treatment facility, address of facility, cost of treatment, etc. And if any of you deal with the public, you'll love this. Time frame, as far back as your computer records exist. Best regards, Ken Kramer, psychsearch.net. Anybody want to help me with that? What the hell does that mean? Okay, so I have a response. You know, some people just don't understand. They just don't know it. So I'll, I'll write, look, we're not a repository for records. You've got to go to the agency that has them. You ask them for the records. Okay. Most people, to be honest, are appreciative. They just don't understand how it works. Thank you very much. I'll go to the agency. Not Ken. His response to my sort of standard, we don't have those, is, well then, be a good public servant and get it into the correct hands instead of just blowing it off. Best regards, Ken Kramer, psychsearch.net. So I'm thinking that's another Christmas card I'm not getting, right? So, you know, th this passes, and a couple years later, I'm, I'm going through the emails, which I do every day for the, whole, for the whole office, and all of a sudden, I'm seeing, oh my God, he's back. This is, this is like about six months ago. This time he's asking for an electronic copy via email of the name, company name, and address of the psychiatrist, your disciplinary board contracts, to evaluate doctors. Okay, I'm, do I have to answer them? Well, one little lesson is, folks, every time you get a request for records, you always respond and make sure you respond in four business days. Now, respond doesn't necessarily mean produce the records. It just means make sure you've responded, you've acknowledged, and said, we've got your request, we're looking into it. And those of you who are on boards, and, and you know, you, if you ever get a request, you know, go see your town manager or go see your chairman, and maybe there's a staff person who can help you. But always make sure that that response gets off, because if you don't, the law says that you've denied access and the person can file a complaint against you with the FOI commission. So I say, what am I going to respond to this guy? How, how am I going to get him you know, to understand this? So in this case, I send him my standard my standard response, and then I say, in this particular instance, I would have no idea who has the records you seek. Could I be any clearer? If you are not the person who handles public records requests, would you please get this into their hands? I don't appreciate being referred. Folks, sometimes you can't just win. You can't win for trying, right? A couple weeks ago, I got a call from a guy. He says, he says, I need your help. And I said, sir, what? What's, what do you need? He says, I need a copy of my naturalization papers. I said, your naturalization papers? I said, isn't that like a federal thing? And he says, yeah, I went to them. They were going to charge me 500 bucks. I thought you might have an extra copy lying around. <laughs> True story. So again, you need, you need to, there needs to be a focus. You, you, you're, you, we try to help. We try to do what we're supposed to do. But, it, but if you don't have it, you know, you have to get them to move on. It's about access, access to meetings, access to records. So when we talk about meetings, here, here's the definition of a meeting in the Freedom of Information Act. Meet me meeting means any hearing or other proceeding of a public agency, any convening or assembly of a quorum of a multi-member public agency, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment, to discuss or act upon a matter over which the public agency has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. For those of you who are on boards and commissions, and those of you who are staff and advise them, my strongest advice is this. Any time you gather to do your work, your elected task, your assigned task, consider it a meeting. Make sure that you've noticed it properly, make sure that it's open to the public, and make sure there are minutes of that meeting when the meeting is done. I get conversations like this. Tom, we just wanted to get together informally beforehand. We don't want to discuss that in public. 
it's a nice thought, but the law doesn't allow it. When you're, when you're in the public arena, you have to do your work in public. Well, what if we form a little subcommittee? It's not a, it's not a quorum of the full board, and that way we don't have to worry about freedom of information. And when I hear that, I always get nervous because that's the recipe for disaster. Somebody's trying to skirt it. Well, guess what? You form a subcommittee, a formal subcommittee becomes a new public agency unto itself. So even if you've got a two-member subcommittee of a 10-member board and you've, you've assigned them a task, they need to follow the same rules. It's, it's always good to think in terms of doing your work in public. Now, there are, there are things that we'll see in a, in a little bit that allow boards to exclude the public, but for the most part, you want to start with that basic the idea that you're doing your work in public. Another question that comes up a lot is, that, well, what if it's not, not a full quorum of the board? And there's a, there's a recent state Supreme Court case that sort of says, unless that not quorum gathering um, has been given a designated task, then that probably would not be a meeting under freedom of information. So you've got you know, three or four members of a board who get together to have a conversation, and they're not assigned a task, they're not a formal subcommittee, that, that could probably sort of operate outside of freedom of information. But our strongest advice is always, if when in doubt, make sure you've, you've thought about it and do your work in public, and that will allow you to avoid being the target of an FOI complaint. The law talks to us about three kinds of meetings. It talks to us about a regular meeting, a special meeting, and an emergency meeting. Regular meeting is a meeting that you have per a schedule that you put together that says we meet on the first and third Tuesday, the second and fourth Wednesday, seven o'clock town hall, eight o'clock library, five o'clock, you know, high school. That becomes your regular meeting schedule. Special meeting is a meeting that you have when you're not scheduled to meet. Now, a lot of people see that word special and they get very, you know, oh my goodness, we can't do this, we can't do that. Special meetings and regular meetings are almost identical. For both of them, you need to prepare an agenda at least 24 hours in advance. Anybody responsible for that? Anybody have that lovely task? Preparing, anybody here preparing an agenda? That's okay. Remember that the law wants you to create an agenda that fairly apprises the public as to what's going to happen. That's, that's the language that the court has given us. So you want to be as specific as possible when you put together an agenda. Perhaps sometimes you use items like old business, other business, new business. That's not the best, but for a regular meeting it's okay because here's the difference between the two. At a regular meeting, should something arise that's not on the agenda, the chairman says, is there any old business? And you say, yes, Madam Chairman, I'd like to talk about this topic. It's not on there. I make a motion that we add it to the agenda. Someone seconds it. If two-thirds of you agree to do it, you can add it to the agenda under old business or other business. But at a special meeting, you cannot add anything to the agenda. So if you're preparing one of those agendas and you have old business on there and there's nothing listed underneath, you might as well take the item off because you can't say, is there any old business, and, and vote to add it. It's really important that at a special meeting you only talk about what's on that meeting agenda. Again, those agendas have to be in at least 24 hours in advance. Now, in today's world, the pandemic world we'll call it, there, there are some variations that have come into the law in the last couple of months. Uh, you, you know, back in March of 2020, the governor issued his executive orders which allowed boards and commissions to meet virtually. And, and set up a, st uh, a standard whereby you put on an agenda at least 24 hours in advance that had the link to, do you guys use Zoom? Zoom or WebEx or Teams, all these different platforms that people are using. And the key is, again, to allow real-time access. Real-time access so that you, you click in. But the new law, we put together a, this went, to a, went into effect July 1st. Um, I left some of these up here for, for uh, if you want to take them, and it's also on our website. But in section 149 of Public Act 21-2, it outlines some stuff. And some of the highlights, I, I won't go into too much of it, but for instance, you do have to have the 24-hour notice for your agenda, but 48 hours in advance, you've got to let the world know that you're going to meet either wholly electronically or partially electronically. There's got to be a notice to that effect, too. Um, then there are, there are requirements for making sure that you record those meetings, that the recordings get put on your website, and, and all of those things come into play. So you want to make sure that, that you 
take a look at that if you're going to have any sort of a virtual meeting or some sort of a, a hybrid meeting, some in person and, and otherwise. Um, this is all new to everybody, and some of these things come up and we say, hmm, we're not sure how that would work, and, and we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to work through some of them now. So far, so good, I hear. Some people um, actually have sort of embraced this idea because it gets more people to actually observe the meetings. You're, you're home, you don't have to run out to a meeting, you can, you can turn it on and watch it there. I'm trying to think, you know, that, that 48 hours for a regular meeting is important. Um, Another one is if someone says, hey, Mike, I don't have a computer. I talked to a guy from a town today. He said, you know, we've got a problem. Uh, we've got a, a lot of older members, and half of them don't have computers. And so if, they, if somebody submits a letter 24 hours in advance of your meeting and says, I need a place to watch that meeting, this law says that you have to do it if it's, a, if it's entirely a regular meeting. Make sure that when you're, if you're participating virtually, if you're a board member, you always identify yourself when you speak and when you vote. That's all, that's all part of this uh, provision too, section 149. So just you know, take a look at that and see, uh, you know, there may be some issues there you want to call later, that's fine. But we're, since we're meeting in all sorts of different ways, in person, in person hybrid and, and virtually, there's a lot of different things to keep in mind. But back to the three kinds of meetings. The third kind of meeting, which I didn't talk about yet, is the emergency meeting. Folks, an emergency meeting is a meeting that I really, really discourage boards and commissions from using. It's an unnoticed meeting. And the reason I discourage boards and commissions from using it is that it is a meeting without notice that the, the law really doesn't want us to use unless it's a real emergency. And the problem is that what you and I think might constitute an emergency might not rise to that level in the eyes of the law. Uh, one of the prime examples I use is we have some holidays in Connecticut that some towns celebrate, some towns don't, some boards celebrate, some boards don't. Uh, and let's take, you know, we got, we got uh, Veterans Day. It's coming up not too far down the road. And some, some towns are open, some towns are closed, some schools are open. Anyway, I'll get a call. I guarantee I'll get a call after Veterans Day this year, and someone will say, Tom, I've got a problem. And I'll say, what's the problem? And they'll say, I've got, a, I've got a meeting tonight. It's our regularly meeting. And I always bring the agenda in at least 24 hours in advance. I brought it down there yesterday. I found out town hall was closed. I forgot all about town hall being closed. So I, so I, I, I put it in this morning. Is that OK? Folks, that's not OK. It's not 24 hours. 24 hours is, is adhered to pretty strictly. So I said, no, that's not all right. It's not. He says, well, we got way too much to do. I'm going to call tonight an emergency meeting. Oops, I forgot, it's not an emergency. In our minds, especially those, you know, not, again, a non-legal mind, it feels like an emergency. But for the purposes of FOI, it's not. And I really encourage you to, to avoid that. People say, well, what could happen? What's the big deal, right? So I'll share a little story with you. Uh, over in the western part of the state a couple of years ago, there was a situation where the assistant fire chief thought that he was going to become the next chief. He got very excited. He heard it, you know, oh boy, I'm going to be the next chief. And then he found out that the rumor was false. Someone had, had fed him a false rumor. He got really, really angry, really angry. And he stormed into the first selectman's office on a Friday afternoon, and I am told they had a doozy, screaming, yelling, cursing, things getting knocked off desks. Finally, the first selectman, who's known this guy for years, says, you've got to calm down, because it's just not going to happen. We're going in a different direction. I tell you what, though, we'll name you the interim chief while we look for a new chief. That way you've got that on your resume and, and, you know, the guy wasn't happy. But he said, oh, all right, fine, you know. He leaves. Well, you know, this town, like all of our towns, with a few exceptions, are small towns and it doesn't take very long. It's all over the place. The phone's ringing off the hook. The, the emails are flying in. The texts are flying in. The essence is, this is bad. He was insubordinate. He was threatening you. This is dangerous. You've got to get him out of there. First selectman thinks about it. He says, well, there may be something to that. So he calls an emergency meeting for the next morning of his, of his board of selectmen, a Saturday morning. He brings the board in. They have this emergency meeting. And they decide, you know what? The guy's no good. They fire him. Now they've got to find him. It's a Saturday morning, right? So they, they send people out all over town. and. They find him. I think he was cleaning out the gutters in his house or something like that. So they haul him down to town hall. Can you imagine? He's got the leaves hanging out of his hair, the whole thing. Thanks for coming in. You're fired. 
he explodes all over again. You SOBs can't fire me. Da, da, da. It's all worked up. Understandably, I might add. And, and he says, because I quit. So he marches out. And they reconvene this emergency meeting and accept his resignation. Now, remember what I said. When people believe they've been denied the rights that this law gives them, they can file a complaint against the public agency with the FOI commission. So this individual files a complaint with the FOI commission claiming that this meeting was improperly staged. It was no, there was no emergency. What was the hurry? And he wasn't notified, and he should have been notified, all that stuff. So he files a complaint. Now, when a complaint is filed, we try to mediate the complaints. We try to bring the parties together. We don't want you to have to go to a hearing. We want to try to bring the parties together. The goal is to make sure that the law is followed. Mediation failed. It goes to a hearing. Hearing officer takes evidence from both sides. I call it kind of like an informal people's court. It's an administrative hearing. And the hearing officer says, you know what, this was clearly an attempt to keep this guy out of the meeting. I find in his favor and recommends that the commission declare null and void everything that happened at that meeting. That's the commission's strongest power. It can basically wipe out a meeting that's improper. So the commission adopts that, and now this guy was fired and or quit at a meeting that didn't happen. End of story, except it's not. Remember I talked about interpretation and there's things that people have to try to figure out. Well, people don't like our decision. They think we've interpreted it improperly, and they appeal it. They can appeal it all the way to the state Supreme Court. And that's what this guy, the town, just didn't like the decision and appealed it and went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, the Supreme Court agreed with the FOI Commission and said the commission was right. There was no emergency there. We also declare null and void what happened at that meeting. Now, if you're familiar at all with the process, that didn't happen in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. That's years. So if any of you are in finance, think about it for a second. Hmm. He was fired and or quit and taken off the payroll five years ago. What's the problem? Aha, they owe him a lot of back pay. And there were some issues with his health benefits that, you know, if he had been on the payroll. So they had a mess on their hands because they didn't wait 24 hours. And then it took them another year to unravel it because they were going back and forth with different, you know, discussions and, and negotiations and anyway. If you have a situation where you're thinking, gee, we can maybe not notice this, I want you to just sort of have this story pop in your head. It's an extreme example. I don't want to let you think this happens all the time. It doesn't. But it's an extreme example of what could happen. And you just think to yourself, we're better off waiting 24 hours, holding the meeting and running it so that it's clearly noticed and it's clear that we're not trying to hide anything. A lot of times people say, well, what constitutes an emergency? What's an emergency? There's no real definition here. But think in terms of keeping people safe, keeping people out of harm's way. Uh, a good example is there, oh, maybe five or six years ago, there was a, uh, a winter where it seemed like we got two feet of snow to every five minutes. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see the heads. You remember that winter, right? A couple of school boards had to have meetings because they looked up on the roof and they said, uh-oh. And they had to get somebody professionally up there, like a crew up there that they didn't have money for. So they had to meet in the morning allocate the money and get the crew up there to get the snow off the roof so that they weren't in, in, a, in a real mess, so that the kids weren't in danger. If you ever have an emergency situation, what you should do is have the meeting, stick to the emergency topic, and within 72 hours create minutes that reflect what the emergency was, who was there, and what you did about it. But again, I come back to my original advice, which is really try to avoid that if you can. It's the easiest way to, to avoid a a problem that you don't need. Now, I, I'm stressing that your meetings are open to the public. Anybody can show up. It's the same when you're doing the, you know, the virtual meetings or the hybrid meetings. Anybody can link in. Uh, when, when you've done this kind of meeting, have you had any issues with, with Zoom bombing? Have you heard that phrase? Do you know what I'm talking about? I see a couple ads going on. When, when, when this first started back in March of 2020, the, the first series of calls that I got was from people who were, you know, just apoplectic, again, rightfully so. We were all locked in, basically, and people with nothing to do would click into these meetings and start, you know, screaming at, at board members. People like from Oklahoma calling board members and in, in board of education in Milford. Um, that was one of the first ones I got, swearing at them, racial epithets, calling them stupid. You have a right to run an orderly meeting, by the way. You have so if people call in like that, yes, it's open to anybody, but if people are 
disrupting the meeting or making that you can you can click them out if you you know if you have a system to do that you can click them out or mute them or whatever you need to do. I'll, I'll share with you. I've I've had one Zoom bombing experience. You'll get a kick out of this. I was doing a workshop at home, uh, and it was a group kind of like a League of Women, Women Voters group. It wasn't League of Women Voters, but it was like that. A lot of nice people, and I'm talking about FOI, blah, 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 and the screen goes black. And all of a sudden, the sort of the reggae, the dance music comes on. Now, my daughter was teaching her first graders in the, in the dining room downstairs, so I thought it was them. And then she yells up, and she says, Dad, where's that music coming from? And I said, uh-oh. The screen goes black, and the strippers parade across the screen right in front of me. And when I tell you they didn't leave much to the imagination, right? And the poor women, I can see them, they're frantically trying to turn, they, we, they finally got them to turn off. So my Zoom bomb experience was at least funny, but beware, beware you, never, you never know what's coming. But to the point, to the, to the serious point, you do have a right to control it. You do have a right to make sure that you can get your business done. And sort of hand in hand with that is the fact that this law does not guarantee anybody the right to speak at a public meeting. And a lot of people think that it does. Only the right to attend, only the right to observe. Now, I know some of you must be on land use boards and you have different, you know, different laws that govern when you have public hearings and things like that. But, but for, under freedom of information, there is no right to speak that's guaranteed anywhere. I get calls on that all the time. They wouldn't let me speak. I wanted to. So if you've got a situation where you know, you're the Board of Finance and it's budget time and you know everybody wants to be heard at budget time, you say, if we're going to get this done, we just can't have unlimited public comment. So you can just tell folks in the beginning of the, of the night, we're going to limit you to two minutes or three minutes. And if you want to do that and that helps you get your work done, you're absolutely within your rights to do that. And one of the boards, well, the board that I was on the longest was the Board of, uh, board of Education in my town. And I was the chairman for the last five. And every budget hearing season, we did that. We said, we, we're, you know, we're, we'll go through this budget, and we know you all want to be heard, but it's three minutes, and we're not being rude, and we're not, you know, denying anybody, but we have to get through it. And so if you want to do something like that, you have every right to do it. You have a right to control. You have a right to, to get your work done. There, there are a couple paths that boards and commissions can use to exclude the public. Has everybody in the room heard the term executive session? You know what I'm talking about? Remember, folks, that an executive session is not something that sits on an island by itself. Frequently, I'll get calls from people that'll say, Tom, we've got a meeting tonight. The only item is an executive session. Does it still need to be noticed and open and all that? The answer is yes. Even if the only item you have is an executive session item, you must notice the meeting. The meeting should indicate executive session planned or executive session likely. You convene in public. Somebody makes a motion to go into executive session, citing one of the five specific reasons. You vote. You need, again, you need a two-thirds vote to go in. You vote to go in. You go into executive session. You discuss. Folks, remember that when you're in an executive session, you only discuss. Do not take action behind closed doors. That's one of the big no-nos in, in the Freedom of Information Act. Discuss, go back and forth, argue, throw things, whatever you want to do. But when it's over, you have to come out to vote. Every vote must be public, and the minutes should reflect who voted for what or for whom. So you go in, the minutes reflect what you went in for, who went into the executive session, and you come out and say, action was taken. If you don't take action, the minutes can say, no action was taken. But you must, you must have all that in minutes. That's, that part of it is still an open meeting. The five reasons for executive session, a personnel matter, pending claims or pending litigation, a security matter, a land transaction. Let's suppose, let's suppose you're going to build a new police station and you're looking all over town for land and you're negotiating with different property owners. You wouldn't have to conduct those negotiations in public. The idea would be that putting the town's numbers out there might, might jeopardize the town's position or the public agency's position. So you could have those conversations behind closed doors. You could negotiate. You could, you know, you review different, I don't know, access roads and things like that. You could have those kind of conversations behind closed doors. And also, if, by the way, if the town is selling property, 
you know, if this, again, you wouldn't have to put your best numbers out there in public. You could have the negotiations, and then you would have to vote in public once it's once you're there. But uh, you wouldn't have to have those negotiations in public. The fifth one, the fifth reason, uh, is a little broader than the others. It allows for a conversation about a document or documents that are exempt from disclosure. Uh, anybody on a board that deals with bids or RFPs, you put a project out to bid or RFP. Uh, let's suppose you're a board of education and you have to put your um, transportation contract out to bid. So all the bus companies, DATCO, M&J, First Student, Durham Services, they all put in bids. And you want to look at them before you make a decision. Well, there's an exemption in the FOI Act that allows a public agency to withhold the content of a bid or an RFP until you've actually signed the contract and concluded negotiations. So at that point, those are exempt documents. Those are documents you're not going to share with the rest of the world. You would go into executive session to talk about the bid contracts, the bid the bids for the bus contract because they're exempt from disclosure. And you go in and you talk about them and you talk about the different bid alternates, the gas pricing, the parking, you know, where the different routes and stuff like that. Um, and then you'd come out to vote. Just by the way, on that one, if you deal with bids at all, that exemption is temporal, which means that it's an exemption until you've actually done the deal or you know, thrown the project out and decided to bid it again or not do it. Then, then all those bid packages do become public, but not until you've actually made, made that decision. Uh, another example on, on the, the document executive session, you, you're a board that seeks a written legal opinion from your attorney. You ask the attorney for a written legal opinion, you now become the client as the board, and you uh, get this written legal opinion, and you don't want to share it with anybody else because it's covered, with the attorney, covered by the attorney-client privilege. So you would go into executive session to have that conversation about the document because it's exempt from disclosure. You're talking about the advice that your attorney has written for you. Again, there, you know, if we if we did a you know, full-blown all-day workshop, we could talk about the different exemptions, but those are just a couple of examples. Again, the, the fifth executive session allows you to talk about a document that you believe is exempt from disclosure. Back to the top, the personnel executive session. First of all, don't ever notice an executive session that says executive session personnel matter or executive session personnel, the courts have repeatedly told us that that's not enough. Now, you don't necessarily have to name the individual. You don't have to name the individual, but you would have to put something like executive session plan, discussion of the performance of a public works employee, discussion of the performance of a zoning office employee, discussion of the performance of a police officer. You don't have to name the person, but you've got to give enough information so that people know exactly what you're talking about, or sort of what you're talking about. Then it's important to know that if you are the employee or if you're the board asking an employee or someone to come in, that person has to be given notice. The person has to be told that he or she is going to be the subject of an uh, executive session. The person then has the right to come forward and say, no, nope, wait a minute, I don't want that in executive session. I want that done publicly. I want everybody to hear it. And if the person does that and demands that, then the board cannot go into executive session. But where people get confused, that's, that's the only right that the person has. Now think intuitively with me here for a minute. Hey, wait a minute, you're talking about me in an executive session? Don't I get to be in the room? Yes, I demand to be in the executive session with you. You don't have that right. You have the right to demand it to be open, but if they go into executive session and you waive that right, whether or not you go into that executive session is entirely up to the board. The board can invite you in, a board can invite anybody into an executive session to give evidence, to give testimony, to hear somebody's side of the story. You know, you know, there's a dispute of some kind, but it's never required. The only requirement for executive session attendance-wise is members of the board that are going into that executive session. So, so keep that in mind when you're, when you're, or if you're on a board that's dealing with a personnel issue. The exec, yes. The discussion doesn't. If the documents are ex are exempt, they remain exempt. Um, but you know, if you're talking about document, it, it depends on whether the documents are exempt. Is the best way to answer the document piece? Well, uh, most evaluations are public, 
So, so they, they ultimately come out. Um, if you're on a board of education, there's a five, I think it's 10 151 C says public school teacher evaluations don't get released, so those wouldn't get released. But it depends for the most part on the, on the content of the document whether or not they come out. But the discussion, I, you know, I, I, I borrow what happens in executive session should stay in executive session. The, the whole point of having it is that the board has the right to have that kind of a conversation. The problem, of course, is that sometimes people talk. And if that happens, there's no violation there, but it's, it's clearly a, a, a violation of protocol. Okay? Sure. The executive session for pending claims and pending litigation is pretty much what it sounds like. There's a pending lawsuit. There's a threatened law, a written threat for a lawsuit. Uh, there's, a, there's an FOI complaint. There's a CHRO complaint. And you want to talk about your strategy. The board has every right to do that, to go behind closed doors. You wouldn't have to reveal you know, what path you're going on to try to defend yourself. It also allows a board to have a conversation about taking legal action. Again, you wouldn't have to tip your hand if you think about it by, by going public with, gee, we're going to go sue somebody. Uh, you're, you're working on a project and the contractor isn't doing the best job and you want to pull his bond. Well, you wouldn't have to reveal that in the public meeting. You go in and executive says, gee, he's doing a crummy job. Do we want to pull the bond? And you could have that discussion before you actually took action without telling the individual that that's what you're thinking about doing. The, the other executive session, uh, the security executive session, is one, frankly, that never really used to come up. But sadly, you know, it's, it's a while now, but since Sandy Hook happened in 2012, it's come up a lot. Um, it's, it's something that those of us in this room never really had to think about or worry about when we went to school. But it's come up with a lot of board of boards of education do we need extra resource officers? Do we need another escape route? Should we have other alarm systems? Do we, have, do we need bulletproof glass? And the idea would be they could have those kinds of conversations behind closed doors on the off chance that the wrong people are sitting in the audience listening to them talk about it. And if that's the case, you know, what they're, they're defeating the purpose because they're telling the people they're trying to keep out how they're going to try to keep them out. So they could have those conversations behind closed doors. Again, remember, in executive session, do not ever vote. I don't ever want to see a set of minutes from Watertown that say, blah, 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 went into executive session and decided to, because that means you've taken action. And if somebody sees that and wants to file a complaint, they can, and you're not going to be successful. You've got to make sure that the vote is in public. Any questions about executive sessions? Sometimes there are other questions about executive sessions. Is that all clear? OK, so I mentioned that there are two paths that boards go down to exclude the public. The second one is kind of funky. And it kind of goes back to when I was talking about, uh, you know, getting that unanimous vote and twisting a few arms. We believe that this, this portion of the law is a direct result of that. I read you the definition of a meeting. The sentence that follows that says, meeting does not include. Meeting does not include. And there follows a list of things, many of which everybody in this room would say, hey, wait a minute, that sounds like a meeting. And the legislature said, well, you can call it a meeting if you like, but for the purposes of freedom of information, it's not a meeting, which means it's not noticed, it's not open to the public, and there are no minutes. Okay. Anybody here involved in any collective bargaining? Your board has to negotiate a union contract or collective bargaining contract? Well, if you're on a board of education, that's one of the most important things that you do. You negotiate teacher contracts, you negotiate administrator contracts, maintenance contracts. Collective bargaining strategy negotiation sessions are not meetings under freedom of information. And if you think about the percentage of a, of a teacher contract, that, uh, that of a, that, what percentage that is of an overall budget, and you're thinking, gee, that's kind of important. Should the public be in on that? But no, the law says collective bargaining, not subject to freedom of information. Executive level search committees. You form a committee to look for an executive level uh, employee. The police commission needs a new chief. The board of education needs a new superintendent. Mark retires to Hawaii, and you need a new town manager, right? Does that sound good? All right. You form an executive level search committee to look for a new person to fill that position. Now that one, when you think about it, makes some sense because if you have a high level position, you want the best possible candidate pool. 
and people might be reluctant to apply if they knew that it was going to be splashed all over town that you were leaving town A to go to town B. So that, the, so that work could be done in public. And by the way, the, the resumes and the applications you know, stay with the committee too unless the person wants them released. Uh, not, not of the successful candidates, but of the, can, of the unsuccessful candidates. So executive level search committees, not a meeting under FOI. Now, my experience is that Watertown's not very political, so you might not need this one. Um, but there's a, there's a provision in the FOI Act for board members to caucus, which means that members of the same board and the same party can meet and discuss, even if it is a quorum of the board, same board, same party, can meet to discuss board issues. Now, that is a giant loophole in what we've been talking about, <laughs> open meetings. We know that that is something that was put in back in 1975 to get a lot of people on board to vote yes. Same board, same party. Where people get into trouble with the caucus folks is that they forget that it's only same board, same party. Your town council has, wants to caucus. He can't go in because once he enters the room, he's not a member of the, of the party and, the, and the, the board. It's not a caucus anymore. It's a meeting. So if you're going to use that provision, same board, same party only. It's very important. Another one that gives me sort of pause and, and, and a chuckle, too, it says, you're allowed to have a chance meeting or a social meeting, neither planned nor intended for the purpose of discussing matters relating to official business. You're all best friends. You want to go out to dinner after the meeting, right? Fine. But when you do that, what else are you going to talk about? Are you really not going to talk about board business at all? Let's be realistic. Let's not be naive. Those discussions are going to happen. Here is my advice on that, and this is, you know, as a former and current board member. Look, what, what did you think about what just happened? What do you want on the next agenda? Can you believe that she said that? But do not have those deep, deliberative conversations over dinner the next night that you should be having here at the table. I guarantee you, I guarantee you the, the one time that you do, that you sort of forget the law and you have this passionate debate about something over dinner, the wrong person sitting in the next booth and files a complaint that you've had an illegal complaint, uh, illegal meeting, and you're gonna, you're gonna be in trouble because you probably did. Avoid the deep deliberative conversations offline that you should be having at the meetings. You know, again, you, you run into people at the grocery store or over at the land field watching a baseball game, that's what you're going to talk. I mean, again, let's not be naive, but be smart about it. S steer away from, you know, steer away from setting your budget over the eggnog at the Christmas party. You know, just, just be smart about it. And to that end, I don't know if you caught it when I read the definition of meeting, whether in person or by means of electronic equipment. Now, electronic equipment was putting back, put back in there, you know, for the powerful chairman. Any board chairs in the room? Anybody? Board chair? You're a powerful board chair, you're a powerful board chair. You get on the phone and you tell your board, I want you to do this, and you're going to vote on that. You got it? This is what you're going to do. Bing, bang, boom, boom. You come to the meeting, all in favor, all in favor, and everybody's saying, what happened? What happened is you had the discussion on the phone before the meeting took place, and you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't set stuff up like that before the meeting takes place. And today we're talking about a lot more than telephones. We're talking about email. We're talking about text. We're talking about... Uh, you know, Facebook conversations, all those things. I'm not telling you not to use those devices or those platforms. That's the way we communicate today, especially today when fewer people are still going out. But do not have the conversations that you should be having here at the table. The chairman sets out a, sends out an article and says, I want everybody to read this. I think there's some really good information in there. Fine. The chairman says, I feel really strongly about this issue. I want you all to know how I feel about this issue. Even that's fine. But the problem comes when somebody counters and says, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and sets off a conversation among board members that you should be having here. Do not cross the line. And people say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, as you'll see in a couple minutes, that those emails are public records. Once you, once you send them out, they become public records by definition. Someone could say, I want to see any and all emails between the chairman and other board members about topic X. Bingo. It comes out not only that you may have had a meeting via email, it comes out all these thoughts that you had that you really weren't ready to share or hadn't really, hadn't really crystallized, you were just sort of throwing ideas around. So again, be really careful the extent to which you communicate offline. The last thing I'll talk about when it comes to meetings is minutes. Any people responsible for minutes in the room? 
Anybody? Uh, there's a, you, reluctantly raising his hand, right? I feel your pain. I feel anybody's pain who has to do minutes. I do the FOI Commission meeting minutes. Here's my advice on minutes, folks. They need not be the recreation of war and peace. They are not every word that everybody says. They are not meant to be verbatim transcripts. The guy stands up at the meeting and says, I want every word of this in the minutes, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you want to, you can, but you're never required to do that. Uh, today, when we're doing sort of this virtual thing, people are emailing things in that they want read at meetings. Well, you can if you want to. It becomes a public record, but there's no requirement that you do that, and there's no requirement that you, you attach it to the minutes. The minutes should be a crisp, clear, concise recapitulation of what happened at the meeting. The only technical requirement is who votes for what or for whom. That's really the only technical requirement. Now, you're, you're creating Watertown's public, you know, uh, uh, the history, your town history, and the historical record, you want it to reflect a little bit at least about conversation, about what boards were thinking, about what, you know, but not every word. Don't burden yourselves with that. And, and that makes that job a little bit easier. And remember that the minutes need to be available in seven days. The minutes are available in seven days. They go into the town clerk's office and also your office so that someone can look at them should they want to see them. Before I give you a little bit about the records provisions, are there any questions about things relating to meetings that we haven't touched on? Anything you want to ask? Yes, ma'am. By FOI standards, it sure is, yeah. There's never a requirement uh, to allow participation. I mean, now, under freedom of information, there are some land use and public hearing issues, but n not under freedom of information. Yes, ma'am. Unless they decide not to, it's it. Correct, correct. Or they don't even need to vote. The chairman could say, you know what, we're going to pass on this topic. We're not going to have it tonight. There's 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 a wide berth for for uh, boards and commissions. Again, if uh, not controlled by FOI, that's entirely up to the board. There's, there's nothing in freedom of information that governs that. Well, in, again, that's entire, it, the law would not, there, there's no violation of the law if someone says, you know what, we're just, we're just going to cut that off. We're not going to have it. You're being disruptive or we don't want to hear it or we want to talk about another subject. The FOI Act would not would not govern that. The pe some people talk about their First Amendment rights, but um, that's not anything that's, that's, there's no place to take that, I guess, unless you wanted to go to court. Okay? Yep. Any other questions about meetings? Okay, so again, I'm going to give you the abridged version of, of the records provisions, because we could do that. I did a class Monday, and we spent, you know, almost an hour and a half on records, so Unless you want to, right? No, just kidding. When, when, we, talk about, when we talk about public records, listen, listen to the words. Public records or files means any recorded data or information relating to the conduct of the public's business, prepared, owned, used, received, or retained by a public agency, or to which a public agency is entitled to receive a copy by law or contract. Whether such data or information be handwritten, typed, tape recorded, videotaped, printed, photostatted, photographed, or recorded by any other method. The second part goes like this. Where are you? Except as otherwise provided by any federal law or state statute, all records maintained or kept on file by any public agency. Whether or not such records are required by any law or by any rule or regulation shall be public records and every person shall have the right to inspect such records promptly during regular office or business hours, copy such records in accordance with subsection G of 1-212, or receive a copy of such records in accordance with 1-212.
So if you heard the words, you're saying, well, wait a minute. The records provision is easy. Everything's a public record. Anybody can inspect it. Anybody can get a copy of it. Case closed. But what makes the records provision so hard to comply with for public agencies of all kinds is that on top of those base definitions, there are numerous exemptions to disclosure. I just you know, ran through two of them while we were talking about uh, the meetings provisions. Executive session, you know, that when it comes to records, there are exemptions, there are exclusions, there are things that by law you cannot release. So you've got to have all that in your head or have it in front of you. But the, but the lesson that I, that I try to impart is this. It's not about, you've got to make sure that if someone makes a request for records, you look at the records, you look at the content of the records. We tend to get possessive. We tend, they're police records, you can't have them. They're, they're town manager records, you can't have them. They're planning and zoning records, you can't have them. Or we get selective, you know. You look like a nice person, we'll give them to you. You look very suspicious, you get nothing. And you, you, you've been here too many times before, out. You get nothing. You want to avoid that. You want to make sure that it's about the content of the records and it's not guessing, it's not speculative, it's these are public records. We look at to see if any of the exemptions apply and then if they're not exempt, we give them out or let somebody look at them. And if they are exempt, we withhold them. And if people don't like the decision that you make, they're exempt for this reason or that reason, they can, they can file a complaint with the FOI Commission and the FOI Commission will ultimately issue a ruling. I'm gonna share a little story with you about um, Here's a situation that shows you what not to do when people ask for records. Again, remember, it's about the content. It's about the content and not who's doing the asking or why they're asking. We have no right to ask. But here's a situation that's a couple years ago in the city of Hartford. It involved an individual who makes a lot of requests. He makes a lot of requests, and sometimes he gets on their nerves. And in this situation, he, oh, by the way, he's a blogger and a public access TV guy, and he's kind of out there publicly out there. So he asked the city of Hartford for two things. He asked the city for billing records submitted to the city by a law firm that's doing some work for the city and then a record of payment from the city to the law firm. So the corporation council issues a response. Remember I said respond in four business days, at the very least. I have your FOI request and will coordinate the response. Such documentation as is allowed or required by law will be provided. So. If it's not a record that you have that you can immediately turn over, that you've got to look for it, you've got to have it reviewed, you want a lawyer to look at it, any of those things, that's okay. That's a perfectly acceptable four-day response. So, so why am I reading you this? Because in the process of responding to this individual whom he does not like, the corporation counsel, the attorney for the city of Hartford, accidentally copied the individual on an email he had written to somebody else about how much he didn't like the guy. We're being recorded, so I'll clean it up, but you'll get the idea. Carl, so who lit a fire under this? It's a bad word that starts with an A. If he's involved in litigation, ongoing, and or other projects that he hasn't asked about, can I shut him down? So his real response isn't, thank you for your FOI request, I'll look into it, you're a, mm, how do I get rid of you? Now, I told you this guy was a, you know, he was out with the blogging and the public access TV and all that, so boom, it's on his blog, it's on the public access TV, and he's connected, it's on FSB at six o'clock, it's in the current the next morning, it's a funny story, you know, they're making, Hartford looks really, really bad. So the corporation council says, hmm, I think I might want to try to fix this, I don't know if you could, Make that out, but those are in your front. That's City of Hartford letterhead, right? City of Hartford letterhead. He tries to walk it back, but he can't do it. In his letter of apology is the following. Apparently, you have little else to do other than to pester me in this office and other city departments. Recall that I do not work for you. The purpose of the FOIA statute is not to provide you a playground. Hey, guys, even if you think that, please don't write it. You've created another public record that says, nah to the law, and just by the way, this law accomplishes a lot of good, and nah to you, and that's it. So he takes another pounding in the media and all that, but from an FOI standpoint, the worst part is that he ne because he feels so strongly about this guy, he never bothered to look at what the records were, he never bothered to look at whether they've, 
Next headline we see is Hartford loses that FOI commission. The guy filed a complaint. He never got any records, and the commission, you know, said, Hartford, you got to give him the records. You violated the law. Everybody deals with difficult people. We have one individual at the FOI commission. Between 2011 and 2016, filed more than 450 formal complaints against various agencies around the state. It reached the point where they were so out of hand that we had to stop scheduling them for hearing because some of them were just clearly off base and they were clearly meant to antagonize people. By the way, some people have taken to using this law as a weapon. We do not encourage that. We try to stop that. We, we don't want that to happen. That's not what this law is about. This law has accomplished a lot of good about making sure that public agencies are transparent, making sure that people can in, engage and involve themselves. But when people do what this guy did and started weaponizing it, for lack of a better word, it's troublesome. He makes, he takes us, oh, by the way, when he doesn't get what he likes from the FOI commission, he files complaints against the FOI commission. I want you to think, by the way, of the logic of filing a freedom of information complaint against the freedom of information commission with the freedom of information commission. So you get, you get the idea. But even when he comes in and asks us for a record, we have to put blinders on. We have to say, this guy's been making our lives miserable. He's got us in court on things left and right. It's about the record. I can't stress that enough. It's about the record. It's either exempt or it's not exempt, and you give it out. Another tip on, on records. People say, well, how long do we have to produce them? You talk about this four-day thing. Well, the law is kind of open-ended. And, and especially since, you know, in the last 18 months, it's become problematic to try to pin it down. But the law doesn't give us a de deadline. I know about you, but I'd like a deadline. I'd like somebody to say, okay, you got two weeks, you got two months, whatever that is. But the law doesn't say that. The law says you must produce records that are not exempt in prompt fashion. Anybody want to take a shot at that? What does that mean? Nobody knew what it meant. It goes to court, and court says, we've got your back on this. Promptly means without undue delay. Remember I talked about interpretation, folks? I talked about you got, so you got to figure out, okay, you know, we got a hurricane coming and somebody wants bus routes from 1973. What's prompt? You know, I mean, what's, what's, what's important? What, what needs to be done? What else is going on in town that has to happen? What's staffing? You know, during the pandemic, offices were closed. People didn't have access to records that were being asked for. It got very problem, you know, how do you, how do you work on that? Because FOI didn't go away. But yet, if people couldn't get in their buildings to get the, you know, so it, those are all things that had to be worked out. If you, if you establish a reasonable, honest response as to what's, a, what's a, a time that it would take to produce a record, you know, if it's only a couple pages, it should, be, it should be immediate. But if it's boxes of records that you have to review, you know, use common sense and say, here's what we've got. This is how long it's going to take. We believe this is a fair and reasonable amount of time to produce these records. And if you're honest about it, and if you're reasonable about it, even if the person is trying to make your life miserable, the commission should. I've seen the commission more often, in fact, almost entirely, if it's a reasonable response, say, no, you, you're OK. You were prompt under those, under those circumstances. The other thing to remember about records is I cannot stress enough that you want to understand that everything is a public record. In your capacity as board members or town employees, once you create something, it's defined as a public record. Yes, it could fall under one of those exemptions. Yes, it could be a record that you're not going to ultimately release. But if you don't want to see it on the front page of the Republican American, think before you write and clearly think before you send. Again, story time, right? So we've all been working, where are you? We've all been working a lot at home online. Uh, here's a situation from one of the major cities in Connecticut. The law department, the law department of this city was looking for a senior legal secretary. All of it had to be conducted online. They, it was all virtual. The town hall, city hall wasn't open. Okay. So at one point in the process, the head of the law department, I stress that again, the head of the law department sends this email to a colleague. I would like you soon to reach out to, 
and the name is blacked out, on behalf of the law department to thank her for her interest in the position and to inform her that we went in another direction. I feel that you have the most experience in our office handling these types of discussions after many years of breaking off relationships with your past girlfriends and flings. What is he thinking? Okay, so he sends this out to his colleague. Now, let's, if we want to give him the benefit of the doubt, say he was just trying to, you know, needle, needle his colleague, have a laugh. You can't do that, folks. And you're saying, well, nobody saw it, right? Court was being held virtually then, too. And the person who received this email accidentally put it up on the screen during a deposition. Oh. Think before you send. Think before you write, because it becomes a public record. I can't stress that enough. I was working at home. It was my own laptop. It was my own desktop. It was my own phone. Doesn't matter. If you create something in the conduct of Watertown business, it's defined as a public record. Yes, it could be exempt. It doesn't mean that somebody comes and grabs your phone and takes everything off. It just means that if someone asks for those records, you would be asked to produce them from your personal device because they have to do with Watertown business. So please think, think, think before you send. Are there any questions? Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you, I, I cut short the, the, the records provisions, I mean, because you have staff that can help you with those things. Um, is there anything you wanted to ask that I didn't talk about? Yes. No. If you want to inspect a record, if you want to inspect a record, you wouldn't have to put it in writing, but um, I don't think the, f the phone is, has been sort of ruled to be not the best way you would, you would appear at a town office. Uh, now, obviously, there's, there's a complication there if the office is closed. If you just want to inspect a record, you should go to the office and say, I'd like to inspect these records. You don't have to put it in writing or identify yourself. If you want a copy of a record, the agency is allowed to ask you to put it in writing. But putting on the phone, they would have no way of identifying you. They would have no way of knowing what the record is or anything like that. So I would say, no, that's a bad idea. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. I'd like to inspect these records. Can I make an appointment? Absolutely, yes. The FOI Act would not require you to fill out a form. Many towns have gone to that so that they can keep their records requests straight. Most people are reasonable and are willing to fill it out, but if they don't want to fill it out, the, the law wouldn't force them to do that. That's correct. Yes, sir. Fortunately, that's not a question we can answer at FOI. There's a whole different set of, I'm being facetious, there's a whole different set of records retention laws and, and you should talk to your town clerk. They're, they're, she'll give you the schedule and she'll say, if you have this for this long, you have this for that long. One of the things to remember about that is purging your records, the old records that you're allowed to get rid of is a good thing because if somebody comes and asks for a record that you should have destroyed 20 years ago and you still have it, freedom of information does stay in play. So it, it, it makes your job easier if you've, if you've properly disposed of the records you're allowed to dispose of. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Action taken and minutes. Not necessarily to file. I know, I know where you're going with this. There's a requirement that a record of the votes of a meeting be available in 48 hours. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal document. You're on planning and zoning. I call up or I go to the P&Z office and I say, can you tell me how they voted two days ago? That's got to be written somewhere so that I can see it. But it's not a formal document that needs to be filed. Some towns go that route. Some agencies do that. But that's not a requirement. It just has to be available in writing to anybody who wants to see it in 48 hours. The minutes are the official document. Okay? Yes, sir.
No, I, I, the, the Freedom of Information Commission would, would recognize that as an issue. I mean, if there are records that you're supposed to have, I would say, you know, taking years to fix it would be a problem, but I think it would be a reasonable, uh, a reasonable hey, look, FOI Commission, we're, we're just not there yet. We're still working on it. We've, we've produced this, which we have, but the other half still is, hasn't, trans, you know, hasn't moved over, hasn't migrated yet, so I think you'd be fine. Now, remember, I'm not, that's not a, an edict or anything from the commission, but my, my instinct is that that would be okay. Yes, ma'am. No. Again, if someone said, I, um, you're the chairman of a board, you raised your hand when I asked about chairs. Someone wants to see, I want to see, I want to see her phone records as they pertain to Watertown business. Or I want to see all the texts on her phone that have to do with Watertown business. It would be incumbent upon you to extract them, if you still had them, and make them available. Someone does not grab your phone and look at it. I, I have to stress that enough. It's only about those items which are directly related to town business. That's the only thing anybody would have a right to. But if you said there's something, I have something on my phone. Then that's, then, then that's the end of the story. That, uh, now, someone could not believe you. I've seen that over and over again. So if they, if they insist on going to a hearing over something like that, then you'd have to, you know, you'd have to be before the, com the hearing officer and say, look, I got nothing. I swear under oath, you know, under, under penalty of perjury, I don't have anything on here that has to do with town business. And if you're credible, then the complaint would be dismissed. I would hope it wouldn't come to that. I would hope that, you know, again, all kidding aside, that people could understand and get along, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Yes, sir. That would help a lot. You know, it, people have asked that for years, uh, yes, and that way it's all in one place. Some towns just don't have the capacity to do that. Some do, some don't. If that were possible and board members were instructed to, you know, use those for, board, you know, don't use your personal devices or at least your personal addresses so that it's all, yeah. I'll tell you a story, little story about that. I told you I was on the Board of Education. I had one member who absolutely could not get that through her head. She could not get it through her head, and I would be sitting there at my desk at the Freedom of Information Commission, and I would get emails from her about delicate Board of Education issues. What's she doing? I mean, of all places to send it, right, if you think about it? I want to see any and all emails between the chairman and the this. What is she doing? At the FOI Commission, of all places. So yes, if they, if you could have, if you could segregate them in any way, that would obviously be be optimal. What else? What didn't we hit on? What didn't we talk about? Are we good? Yes, sir. We, yeah. Usually, they take you know the stocks that they have. They people. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the 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 most stringent penalties are. I mentioned the null and void for meetings, in that story that I told, individuals could be fined anywhere from twenty to $1,000. I will be honest with you. Our commission tends not to be punitive. Our commission tends to try to just make sure the law is followed. Those are the most, I mean, those are the most stringent penalties. The, <laughs> the commission has ordered people to come and listen to me, <laughs> you know, ordered a workshop to be held if towns that just appear to be totally off the rails. And also, you just you don't want to be a public board that's found to be in violation of the law. I mean, that's probably one of the one of the most impactful decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would have been my advice. That's a very, you're very astute. That would have been what I would advise them to do. Even, even after, even after the, I right, say files a complaint, rather than appeal the decision, why not just re-notice the meeting and do it again, and then, okay, you, want, you go to a hearing or something, but there's, there's no remedy. It becomes moot. 
had a very similar case that I dealt with in Woodbridge. There was a situation where a, a, um, an officer, a ranking officer, was watching before his eyes as his position got eliminated, and the board was, the commission was doing it in the executive session. And they didn't follow the rules properly. They didn't notify him. They didn't do any of this stuff. So he filed a complaint. Well, their attorney knows the law, and once he realized what this board had done without his advice, he said, guys, do it over again. So they did it over again. The guy still followed through with the complaint, but all he got was our commission declaring the meeting null and void. Well, it was already null and void because they had gone back and done it properly, and there was no real remedy. So you're, you're absolutely right on the money. Yep. Okay, so I bring with me some of these. I call this the Freedom of Information American Express card. Don't leave home without it. They're small highlight cards of the Freedom of Information Act. They're good for a pocket, a wallet, a desk drawer, a purse. Take them and have them as important as the, what's in here to, to help you on the fly. I was going to say our address, but I, I just noticed that we just moved last month, so the address is wrong, but the, um, but the phone number is important and the email address is important. I don't want you ever to feel that you can't call or that you can't check in. I would rather have you contact me before something becomes a problem. No question is stupid. This law can be difficult. And I also have, I don't have a lot of them, but they're um, charts, meeting charts, when to notice meetings, how long minutes are doing, things like that. And the one over to the far side, there's a couple extra copies of the, the primer that we've put together about the electronic meeting provision that, that passed uh, as of July 1st. That is in its entirety on our website. So if we run out of copies or you don't want to make extra copies, it's all on our website and you can take a look there. Anything else? Oh, one more. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great question. No. If it's in paper, you have a right, you know, I didn't go too deep in the documents. A public agency can charge, a municipal public, public agency up to 50 cents a page. If it's, elect, if it's not electronic, if it is electronic, you produce it that way and there's no fee. But if it's a piece of paper, you do not have to scan it and send it. It's 50 cents a page. Yep. Anything else? Well, for, yes. I'd be happy to do that. There's an exemption for things that are in personnel files it's, if it's an invasion of privacy, okay? Now, we start off with the basic fact that personnel files are public records. To not release something in a, in a personnel file, someone would have to determine that there's an invasion of privacy. So I ask for your personnel file. You work for a municipal entity. The HR person looks at it and say, would releasing this be an invasion of this person's privacy? The standard for invasion of privacy comes to us from a 1993 state Supreme Court case. It's called the Perkins decision. Perkins is, was a teacher who objected to the release of her attendance records. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, those of us who work in the public sector, our attendance records are public records, period. And to have been an invasion of her privacy, the release of those records would have to have been both highly offensive and not a matter of public concern. It's got to meet both prongs of the test. So the HR person looks at it and says, would releasing his stuff be highly offensive and not a matter of public concern? If the HR person says, no, it wouldn't, out the record goes. You get a heads up after the fact. But if the person thinks that it would be an invasion of your privacy, he comes to you and you say, yeah, I agree, don't release it. It meets those, those two terms. Then the process stops. The records don't get released unless the requester files a complaint with the FOI commission and the commission says, sorry, Watertown, you're wrong. Release the record. There's no invasion of privacy. Just to illustrate, because you're thinking, what, what does that mean? Highly Middletown, a few years ago, a situation where a police officer was rumored to be having all kinds of difficulty at home, real difficulty. The rumors got so loud that they took him off the street and they put him on desk duty. They did an internal affairs investigation. A lot of people say internal affairs, nobody's going to see that. No, that's a public record too. The, the IA report indicates that he was having trouble at home and it details some of those issues. Then it says it's not impacting his ability to do his job. He's doing a good job. They put him back on the street. The Hartford Current makes a request for that IA report. 
Middletown PD looks at it and says, we believe it would be offensive to tell everybody what's going on in this guy's world. And it's not a matter of public concern because it's, he's doing a good job. It has, this has nothing to do with this. Invasion of his privacy. He agrees. They refuse. Currents refused. The current, as is its right, files a complaint with the FOI Commission. The Commission looks at the report and says, there's a lot about this guy's home life in here. It's really nobody's business. It would be highly offensive to tell the rest of the world about what's going on in this guy's home. And it's clearly not a matter of public concern because he's doing a great job as a police officer. He's back on the street. It meets both prongs. Complaint dismissed. The report was never released. The key is that it's got to meet both prongs. A lot of times people will see it and there's highly offensive material in there and they'll pull it back. But it's a disciplinary situation or it's a situation where somebody's been fired or fined or suspended. That does become a matter of, it's got to meet both. It, it can't be both. It can't be one. It's got to be both. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Okay. Law enforcement, law enforcement exemption. It's, it's uncorroborated is the world, it's, but it's the same thing. What that means is that the police go to a, a scene. It's a sort of a he said, she said, or he said, he said, fight sort of situation. They can't decide if there's anything. In fact, they, it's so you know, unknown that they take no action. It's uncorroborated. If it's uncorroborated, there's an exemption in the law enforcement piece that says you don't have to give it out. Now, it's a permissive exemption. You can if you want to, but uncorroborated allegations means just that. It's a complaint. It's a situation where there's no proof. They took no action. They didn't seek a warrant because they couldn't tell what happened. And, and that's a, an exemption that you're allowed to withhold, to, to invoke. You want to hear the, the most infamous uncorroborated allegation in the, in the state? It happened a few years back, not far from here. Uh, John Rowland was running for governor. And he had a bit of a fight with his soon-to-be ex-wife, Debbie, in their home in Middlebury. Police were called, and uh, they, they just couldn't make any heads or tails of what happened. They just, they, they just couldn't. So no action was taken, but the media got a hold of it and immediately wanted copies of the report. Chief Bone in Middlebury said, no, we're not. It's uncorroborated. We're not going to give it out. So the media folks filed a complaint. The FOI Commission heard it, and actually the FOI Commission hearing officer said, you know what, there's enough corroboration there. We order release. The Roland people immediately appealed it, and the judge flipped the decision and said, no, it's uncorroborated. We're not going to give it out. Um, for better or for worse, it's worth mentioning that the judge who made that decision wound up being appointed to the Supreme Court by Governor Roland. <laughs> but, you know, that's life. That's life. So there you go. What else? Anything else? All right, now you know what's going to happen, right? You pick up your things and we leave. And you say, oh, I should have asked him. Again, I stress, please do not hesitate to pick up the phone and call. We're happy to try to help. If I don't know an answer, I'll, I'll tell you I don't know and I'll get, I'll get it for you. So if there's nothing else, thanks, everybody. Okay, you're welcome.